Hi, I'm Marshall Ball, here to talk to you about randomness extraction from somewhat dependent sources. This is joint work with Oded Kolderek and Tal Malkin. So what is randomness extraction and why, why, why do we care about it? Uh, so we know that randomness is essential uh, for, for many, many things in, in computer science. Um, for any meaningful notion of security in cryptography, we need randomness is absolutely necessary. Um, and we know in, in sort of for algorithms that uh, many cases randomness, uh, we know many randomized algorithms that are uh, much more efficient than, than their deterministic counterparts for example, testing identity of polynomials. Um, and uh, in many cases, uh, the gaps between what you can do ran with randomized algorithm versus deterministically so in sublinear settings is, 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 uh, is provably, pro there are provable gaps. Uh, so randomness is incredibly important. And in all of these cases, these, we model uh, randomness that we're giving our algorithms or our cryptographic schemes as uniformly random bits. Um, however, in reality, the sources of randomness look very, very far from, from random coin tosses. Um, they tend to be, you know, measurements of uh, heat and uh, timings of uh, certain actions and stuff like this. Um, and so, so randomness extraction is how can we take these sort of weakly random sources and uh, to turn them into to to uh, excellent uh, excellent random sources, uniformly random bits. So, right, uh, randomness extraction is a deterministic function that takes as input some randomness source x, and we want that the output of this function is statistically close to uniform. Okay, uh, that's a bit informal. Uh, what what? What do we mean? How do we model a natural source of randomness uh, here? So uh, we say that uh, uh, a randomness source X, which in here we're going to, throughout this talk, we're going to think of our randomness sources as supported on uh, bit strings of length N. Um, and the notion of sort of the minimal notion of uh, being weakly entropic that we want here is is a notion of unpredictability. So we want that the, our source has, uh, we want to extract from sources that have sufficient min entropy. So what is min entropy? As you can read on the slide, it's the logarithm of the inverse of the most probability of the most likely event. In other words, we say that a source has min entropy k if no, event, no uh, outcome occurs with probability greater than uh, two to the minus k. And you can think of this as a, a worst case version of uh, Shannon entropy. So it's sort of this is sort of a, what we want is sort of a, a baseline, a minimal requirement of some weak source. Um, and there's sort of been two principal branches of research uh, uh, at this point um, into, into randomness extraction. Um, in the first studies, uh, the first in the first branch, uh, we model our sources just as sources where the only constraint is that there's sufficient min entropy, min entropy at least k. So the 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 pro here is right. Uh, the advantage is that that this is sort of the most uh, general treatment of randomness sources. We're assuming as little as possible about the natural source, which is great. The, the, the downside of this branch of research is that uh, deterministic extraction is actually impossible um, in this very general, most general setting. So this branch of research studies what are called seeded extractors. So in a seeded extractor, we assume that the extractor has a, a very short, just logarithmic in length, a random, uniformly random seed, in addition to this very, very long uh, or potentially very long uh, source of randomness X with a lot of entropy inside of it. Um, and the goal is to get that out. But unfortunately, like if you're, our goal is to turn weak randomness uh, into pure randomness, if we want to argue if the weekly, if the universe is weakly random, then it must, uh, pure randomness must exist. This, this kind of extractor um, does not help us uh, get there. 
because it requires this uniformly random seed, and where is this seed going to come from? So the second branch of research um, does not require this seed, but instead makes a, a structural assumption on uh, the source of randomness itself. So it considers sort of that in this setting, you're given two independent sources of randomness, each with uh, sufficient min entropy. And the, right, the advantage here, as I said, is that you can in fact extract. The disadvantage, obviously, is that you're making this structural assumption. They are assuming that these sources are independent. And maybe in certain settings, uh, this assumption may be inappropriate. Um, so in this work, we ask sort of the natural question, can we relax this independence assumption? So this is a natural question. And in fact, uh, it's a question that was asked by Benny Shore and Oded Goldreich in 1985 when they sort of initiated and launched this, this branch of research into two source extractors. Um, and they proved this theorem uh, whose moral or interpretation is that if these sources, if you have two sources with even very small dependence, then extraction becomes impossible. And this negative result unfortunately seems to have led to a lack of uh, research, further research in this topic for the past uh, 40 odd years. Um, uh, but the starting point of this work is sort of asking exactly what uh, what do we mean by small dependence and looking closer at what we mean by small dependence. So, so, so it's very clear what it means for two sources to be independent. However, uh, for sources to have small dependence, there's a variety of interpretations that one might have. And Benny Shore and Goldreich, Odette Goldreich gave one in their uh, seminal, seminal work. Um, but in this paper, we present uh, three uh, different definitions, um, each with sort of a semantic uh, payload, if you will. Um, they sort of have an interpretation um, that may or may not make sense. It's not, we're not saying that one of these, any of these models are particularly the right definition of bounded dependence, but sort of just trying to sort of systematically study um, uh, randomness extraction in the context of uh, limited dependence between your sources. So, so uh, we have these three models, uh, bounded coordination, bounded cross influence, and bounded mutual information. Uh, uh, the left is sort of the least general. Um, as you move to the right, you, the classes grow and grow, uh, at least with the same parameter T, right? All of these models are parameterized. The T is sort of controlling exactly how uh, dependent these sources are. Sort of as a sanity check of T, for all of these cases, if T equals zero, you recover uh, the case of independent sources. So, uh, um, and if T equals sort of the min entropy of the sources themselves, then you'll recover the case of uh, the sources uh, X and Y, in fact, being identical. So we look at these models in the context of randomness extraction, and uh, we show that uh, in only in the first model can you extract, and in the other cases you cannot. So this seems uh, somewhat discouraging. However, we do show that you may not be able to extract in the second case, for example, or the third. But in the second case, you can condense and you can condense quite well. So I'm not telling you exactly what condensing means. I will later. Uh, but basically, it means that we can uh, compress this source such that to get so that the output has very high uh, in entropy. Uh, and in the third model, Again, uh, we we still can condense. However, it's uh, the condenser that we get the quali the the condensers that you can that that exist are qualitatively worse than in the second case. Okay, so you're probably wondering at this point what are these models, um, and so uh, without further ado, uh, let's dive in. Okay, so the first model is T coordinated sources. So as a motivating example, imagine uh, the following class of uh, pairs of sources. So imagine that we have a bunch of sort of atomic uh, independent micro events 
um, which may or may not, each individually may or may not have some entropy. Um, collectively, there's some entropy across this whole sort of uh, sequence. Um, but uh, but yeah, we're not making any assumptions about the, the individual things. And we'll think of our two sources that we're going to give to the extractor as simply subsequences of these atomic microsources. So one notion of uh, how coordinated uh, or how um, how how much uh, dependence there are between two such sources formed in this fashion would be to just measure like how much intersection, right? How many how many of these sort of what is the size of the intersection between these uh, subsequences in these x sources x and y? Um, so sort of a more uh, general notion of this uh, specific example is the notion what we call t coordinated sources. Okay, so in a t-coordinated source, to the two sources x and y, we say they're t-coordinated if there exists some some random variable z uh, supported on at most two to the t things, um, such that if we condition on any outcome, specific outcome of z, uh, x and y become independent. Okay, so. Uh, an equivalent formulation, in fact, of this this uh, model is uh, it follows. So imagine that uh, Alice and Bob each have access to their own private, uniformly random coins. Of course, the extractor cannot see these coins, otherwise it would be very easy to get to randomness. But they're trying to generate these sources, the sources to give to the extractor adversarially. Uh, so T-coordinated uh, sources are uh, the sources that Alice and Bob can generate. Alice is going to output the X portion, the X source, Bob is going to output the Y, and these are the sources that they can, they can sample by communicating at most t bits okay um, that's the first model our second model t uh, cross influence um, so uh, this model we're trying to so whereas the previous model was sort of capturing uh, sources where the, the, there's a bound on the potential influence of one source on another, here we're, we want to bound sort of the actual influence. So um, we're going to think of these sources as being sampled by these functions x and y um, that are taking in these uniform random variables uh, rx and ry. Um, and uh, before we say what cross influence is, let's say what we mean by influence. So we say that the influence of Ry on X is at most T if for any uh, particular R, little r of X, uh, little Ry, the probability that, that the output of X on Rx, Ry, uh, uh, changes uh, when we re-randomize the ry input and replace it with the uniformly random input uh, is bounded away from one by two to the minus t additively. Um, so with this in mind, uh, we say that uh, uh, x and y have t cross influence. If there exists these sort of generating functions x and y, such that uh, the influence of Ry on X plus the influence of Rx on Y is at most uh, T. Okay. Um, so we can rephrase this as uh, the, uh, the for all Rx, Ry, um, this the product of the probability that uh, the output of x on rx, ry stays the same when we re-randomize ry times the product, times the probability that the output of y uh, stays the same when we randomize uh, rx um, should be at least 2 to the minus t. Okay. Um, so for those of you who are familiar with uh, Boolean functions, you might be asking yourselves, why are we considering this worst case notion of influence 
Uh, and the reason is uh, basically because we can't uh, even condense uh, the standard average case notion of influence if you plug that into this definition. And the basic idea here for why this we can't condense is um, there's a there's a pair of sources with one at most one bit of average case uh, cross influence. Um, uh, that are identical with probability one half. So there's basically no hope of getting anything meaningful here. Um, uh, on the other case, this, this, these pairs of sources have very high um, worst case uh, influence, this particular case at least. Okay, so our third model uh, uh, probably needs very little introduction. Uh, how do we quantify uh, dependence between two sources, uh, mutual information? So the mutual information between sources X and Y is equal to the, the, the entropy of X uh, plus the individual entropy of Y minus the joint entropy of X and Y. And we say that these two sources have at most T mutual information if we can bound the mutual information by T. Um, and right, this again has a natural interpretation. So if we think about again, like these Alice and Bob uh, generating protocols, um, uh, Alice and Bob trying to sample uh, our sources, um, this corresponds to sources that Alice and Bob can sample while exchanging at most T bits about, of information about the respective source. Okay. So we have these these uh, three models, and I claim that uh, the left is the least general and the right is the most general. We have these containments, and, and let's let's dive into to this and 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 our results on extraction as well. But let's start with the relation between the models. <clears throat> so I claim that the first model is approximately strictly contained within the second model. What do I mean? Um, I mean that if any pair of sources x and y is t coordinated then this sources x and y are uh, epsilon close to having at most t plus log 1 over epsilon cross influence okay so it's approximately any t coordinated sources are approximately contained um, uh, in uh, in in um, sources in the class of sources with at most t prime across influence uh, where 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 t prime is very close to t um, um, and this containment this approximate containment is strict uh, because there exists a pair of sources um, with very little cross influence that is uh, statistically far from even uh, any two highly coordinated sources okay um, what about the second and third case? So we also show that any two sources with T cross influence um, are strictly contained in the third model. So, so they have at most T mutual information. And again, this containment is strict. So um, any two sources, uh, there exist a pair of sources, sorry, um, who have very low mutual information, but they're statistically far from uh, any sources with relatively high cross influence. Okay, so this sort of quantifies a relation between the model. I should mention that the first model is, uh, even though we can only show that it's uh, approximately contained in the second second model, um, it's the the containment in the third with of the first and the third is 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 is, is strict. Um, is perfect. So. Uh, Right, let's move on to our results about um, extractors and condensers. So uh, mod here I'm going to use to denote some model of distributions over uh, pairs of uh, sources, bit strings of length n. Um, we say that uh, something is an epsilon extractor for a model um, if for every pair of sources in the model the output of the extractor on this pair of sources is epsilon close to the uniform distribution. So here M is, is that, just uh, the output length of the, the extractor. So UM denotes the uniform distribution over M bit strings. Okay. Um, and uh, recall the definition of uh, what it means for something to be an epsilon condenser for a model mod 
uh, with deficiency d, so uh, condensers, again, a function from uh, two n bits to n bits, um, such that for any pair of sources in the model mod, um, the output of the condenser is uh, epsilon close to some distribution that has min entropy um, at least m minus d. And recall that m is the, 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 sub, uh, the length of the bit strings that this distribution is supported on. So, so right, as d goes to zero, uh, you recover um, the definition of an extractor. So you want extra condensers with the smallest deficiency possible. Okay. Um, so we know that the extractors are useful. Um, I claim that condensers are also very useful. So they're particularly useful, um, right? Again, in this setting, right, we imagine that we want, we are only given access to some imperfect randomness source. Um, and we want to, to, to do something um, where, in, where maybe we only have, uh, like, we only have provable guarantees when given access to uniformly random coins. So in certain situ sort of offline situations, you can use a seeded extractor to sort of uh, de-randomize um, uh, randomized algorithms, for example, by simply uh, uh, applying all possible seeds to the extractor and trying to run the algorithm on all possible uh, outputs of the extractor. Um, right, you can do this in sort of offline setting. Um, but right, I claim the condensers are useful in certain cases when de-randomizing a seeded extractor um, is uh, either dangerous or inefficient. So why might it be dangerous in cryptographic settings, right? We can't simply just uh, uh, try things with say correlated keys. This, this might break uh, security guarantees entirely. So condensers have a, a utility in certain cases in cryptography um, and randomized algorithms, right? This de-randomize, this sort of generic uh, de-randomizing approach that I sketched um, uh, it gives you an right if our seeds or lengths log n, right? You have to run you have to run their algorithm n times, and this might be too inefficient. Um, and in sub the sublinear algorithm setting, where we really care about efficiency, um, right? And we're bounding the number of queries or something that we're making to to the input. Um, uh, if we have to enumerate over n uh, seeds and run our uh, sublinear algorithm n times, our query complexity might blow up and we'll lose, n, maybe we'll lose any uh, meaningful guarantees. So in all these settings, uh, if you're in such a setting where you need to do something sort of online or you can't uh, reuse, uh, replay your randomness for, for whatever reason, um, uh, uh, condensers might be the tool for you. Okay, so what can we show about extracting and condensing with respect to these three models? So first we show that you can extract from t-coordinated sources, a positive result. And so there's a meaningful notion, right, of uh, bounded dependence uh, between your sources where extraction is indeed possible. So right, if what we actually show is that, right, if you take any two source extractor and extractor is a epsilon extractor for the case of genuinely independent sources with min entropy k n, uh, of which we know a variety of examples because this literature is, uh, is quite extensive here. Um, then uh, you can take this without any modifications and get a two epsilon extractor for the case of T coordinated sources with min entropy T k plus t plus log one over epsilon, um, and we show that uh, this theorem, so right, uh, is essentially optimal. Uh, crafting a tailor-made uh, extractor for t-coordinated sources isn't going to buy you anything. This loss of t plus log one minus epsilon is is unavoidable. Um, and the high-level idea for why t-coordinated sources are uh, you can extract from these sort such uh, pairs of sources is basically because these guys are convex combinations of, of independent sources. Okay. 
so this this seems like a relatively uh, elementary theorem, but I'd like to highlight a sort of a very nice, what I view at least as very nice application of, in the domain of uh, the c communication complexity of sampling. So imagine Alice and Bob, right? Uh, they have a random coin and they want to sample uh, uh, this distribution. So Alice is going to output X, which is uniform. Uh, Bob is going to output Y, which is uniform and independent of X. And Bob also additionally wants to output uh, the inner product of X and Y. Okay, so we, it's well known. And the question is like, how many bits do Alice and Bob need to communicate to sample these distributions? Okay, right, so, so, so it's well known that to compute an inner product between two inputs, um, even if Alice and Bob are randomized, uh, they need to communicate a linear amount and uh, uh, in input length. Um, but uh, right, there are, there are some certain situations where where sampling uh, from from like sampling a, a hard relation is much easier than sort of computing it in one direction. So for example, it's uh, for AC zero, right? AC zero uh, constant depth circuits. It's well known that constant depth circuits can compute parities, um, but it's very easy to sample a uh, string with its parity in constant depth. Okay. But here, uh, right, uh, the, we don't have this uh, discrepancy. Uh, the, if Alice and Bob want to sample this distribution, they need to communicate at least 0.49 n bits. And this is very easy to show. So here's the proof, it's three lines. So um, suppose not, uh, then we know that the inner product is a two source extractor for k at least slightly greater than uh, half n times n. And moreover, uh, n minus t minus some constant is at least is slight, is greater than 0.51 n. So uh, from this in the theorem we saw in the previous uh, slide, we know that the inner product of these uh, Alice and Bob's outputs, uh, uh, if we concatenate to Alice's output x, a 1, um, we know, right, we're not uh, harm harming anything. We still have the min entropy that we did before and, uh, right, no coordination, additional coordination is necessary. And so the output of this uh, from the theorem on the previous slide um, is, uh, is uh, close to being uniform. But on the other hand, right, if we just simply do the arithmetic, we know that the inner product of this uh, distribution is always zero, which is a contradiction. So uh, from this, we can derive that uh, Alice and Bob uh, can sample these sources with low communication. Okay, uh, moving on. So uh, to the second model, so we show that uh, you can, as I mentioned, you can condense uh, pairs of sources with at most T cross influence. In particular, if C A N D is an epsilon condenser with deficiency D for the case of independent sources uh, with meta entropy K, um, and right to any two source extractor is also, of course, a condenser. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, so if you take any such uh, condenser for the case of independent sources, then you immediately have a condenser for the case of sources with uh, bounded cross influence. So in particular, you have a two to the T times epsilon condenser with deficiency D plus T for T cross influence sources of min entropy K. So we don't view the, the two to the T uh, loss uh, in the, the error um, of the condenser to be uh, particularly bad, but uh, instead the deficiency parameter seems to be more important. Uh, but this loss is maybe not so terrible if T is, is small. Um, uh, we show though uh, that, uh, that there's no hope of doing any better than this. Um, again, you might think that maybe we can craft some tailor-made condenser for this particular model. Um, but you won't do any better than what you can do within a condenser for independent sources, right? Uh, in other words, there is no uh, two to the minus t uh, uh, condenser with deficiency little o of t um, 
uh, less than t, you know, whose output length is at least t for it to be non-trivial uh, for t cross influence sources of mean entropy uh, um, approaching n, n minus t. Okay, um, and how do we show this upper bound? Well, the way that this upper bound works is actually through yet another model of uh, uh, bounded dependence between sources. So this model we call uh, T min entropy loss. So recall the definition of mutual information, uh, right? Uh, it's the sum of the individual entropies of the sources minus the sum of the joint entropies. And we want to bound this, um, this difference uh, by T. So what is min entropy loss? We just simply uh, replace uh, these Shannon entropies with uh, mean entropy. 